Welcome back everybody to the security stream for the GSC conference. And, uh, my name is Jamie Pease. I'm the chair of the uh, security stream. You've probably heard me say it so many times now, you're probably like, yes, yes, we know who you are, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome back Isha. So if you remember, uh, if you joined the conference last week, Isha was uh, with us uh, and her topic was trust no one. And this week I'm pleased that she's back with us to tell us uh, what's new in ZOS crypto. Um, so Isha's session is 1BI, and I've already told her that there's no pressure that the fact that this is the last security session of the conference, by all means not the end of the conference, but it's the last security session we have on the agenda this afternoon. So no pressure, Isha, like I said, and it's over to you. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Since I'm the last session, I can just go for like two, three hours. It's not yeah, 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 go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I just want to say uh, hello to everyone. It's good to see you again. I don't know if everybody attended the session from last week, but if not, my name is Isha Shreen Powers. Um, I'm a developer architect. I come up on the development side of IBM, working specifically on, on cryptography, looking at compliance and all of those sorts of things. Um, I do like the interaction and I see a few faces and names that are in the in the chat, a few people in the participants that have attended earlier sessions. So thank you for coming back and joining the session. I um, know this is the last security session of the day, so hopefully this is a, a really good one. Um, just similar to the last session, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the chat on the side um, just so that, let's see, I can see that and um, engage. So. So yes, thank you all for, for returning back. And hi, Patricia, I see you there too in the chat. So feel free to say hello in the chat. Feel free to ask questions. And this session today is gonna to be focused, the primary goal of this session really is to tell you about new features, right? So that's one thing. But then also there are some scenarios and um, things that are unique about ICSF and things that are unique about ZLS and crypto that I also would like to refresh you guys on. So I created some new slides this year um, around some, you know, some areas of, of crypto, some major concepts that people tend to have trouble with. And so um, I'm going to take you through some of those. So bear with me if you know it already, but if not, hopefully it sheds some light on some just common questions. So you're going to see a little bit of that in the beginning. And if there's some time at the end, I will also share some of that information too. So you'll, you'll see that as we go through the deck, but please ask questions. Let me know what kind of features you're interested in, things that you would like to use. And, and we're happy to take that feedback in or connect you to people to get more information too. I do not pretend to say that I know every detail about everything crypto. I try, but I don't. And, um, and what I would like to do is, you know, if you have the kind of questions, ask me, I'll get you those answers. And if I can't, then I'll put you in touch with someone who can get you more details as well. So please engage, please, please talk and please enjoy the session. Okay. Um, first, just a reminder, I'm sure you've seen this all week about the charity raffle. Make sure that you go ahead and participate if you have not already. Okay, so now let's get into the fun stuff. So many of you have seen this slide before. What I'm going to do, I'm going to slide over some of these windows that I have on my screen, and I'm going to pull up my laser pointer because it's important just to look at the stack um, as we go through this conversation, not just about what's new in crypto, but also understanding some of the, you know, like I said, a couple of, of concepts that tend to be more confusing. So here um, you kind of see like this entire ZOS crypto stack with the UC, ICSF kind of in the center there. And normally there is a black box, but when I transferred the, slide, <laughs> the slides between like one and another, it lost some of the cool things, but just um, draw an imaginary line around this section here. And that essentially is the ICSF box. So ICSF is kind of the middleware in the center, kind of holding all of this together. So above ICSF, you're going to have multiple components as part of ZOS. And these are different components that are going to be invoking ICSF to do crypto operations. Now, in some cases, you'll notice that for these components, like let's take system SSL, for example, they can do software crypto as well. So they don't always have to call ICSF. They can also you know, call CPACF directly. So they don't have to go through ICSF there either. So you'll see for some of these components, you'll see software, you'll see CPACF, but generally those that are in these boxes here, they can all make use of, of ICSF. 
So there's different types of crypto engines that are available on the platform. They can go through ICSF to get to the Crypto Express. They can go through ICSF to get to CPACF. Um, they can just call CPACF directly. They can call software directly. There's many different ways to do crypto on, on the platform in general. And you'll see things like system SSL and comm server and DFSMS with the data set encryption and PKI, Java, RECF, WebSphere, um, RMF, encryption facility, DB2. So all of these different you know, subsystems, applications, components, they can all make use of crypto in some way, whether it's via ICSF or other. So let's take a look at, at our imaginary ICSF box here. And, and when you think about ICSF, there's really two different architectures that are supported in ICSF. There's the, the CCA, the Common Cryptographic Architecture, and then there's the PKCS11, which is the kind of originally RSA standard PKCS11, now it's OASIS standard PKCS11, but it's the public key cryptographic standard. And the idea is that you have these two different architectures and they each have their own set of call services, they each have their own set of key management properties, they each have their own configurations for the Crypto Express adapters, and they can call different engines. And so depending on your application, so if you're writing a custom application, maybe you want to do an encryption operation. And so you have to decide if you want to call something like CSNB SAE, which will do AES encryption with secure keys, or you can decide, no, I'm going to call PKCS11, which is the CSF PSKE callable service. So depending on which architecture you care about or want to use, you can use one or the other. And there's a different, completely different set of APIs uh, depending on your choice there. Now, you might also think to yourself, well, how do you make that decision to decide whether or not you want to go to CCA or do you want to go to PKCS11? And it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to write an application using smart cards and financial transactions and duck putt and EMB, you're definitely going to be on the CCA path because CCA, that is its specialty. It does do general crypto as well, but it definitely it has all of those APIs that are necessary to do things like um, the operations that you need for, for smart card processing. That's all like built into CCA side. And then you also have like the PCI HSM support and those kind of things that are all built on the CCA architecture. Now, if you're doing general crypto or you're working with the government and you need you know, that FIP certification, then you're probably gonna go down the PKCS 11 path where you're gonna call those APIs because you know you can do the, the, you know, the FIPS checks on those. You know, you're gonna have that type of certification you know, through the software, you know, all the way through to the hardware. And so you can kind of use those as just general guidelines as to which way to go, but it's really up to you. You have both options at your disposal. Now, some things to consider as well are the different engines that are available to the different architectures. So here on the green side for your CCA services, you can call or you can invoke the CCA device driver, and that will get you to your Crypto Express cards, assuming they're configured as a CCA coprocessor. So if you want to get to a CCA coprocessor, you go down the CCA path. If you're on the CCA side, you can also make use of CPACF, right? So that's the crypto that's you know built right into the hardware, available with the different instructions. And you can also make use of that via CCA. So you see all that green section there of things that you can access and use via CCA. Now on the blue side, uh, PKCS11 side, you see that there's a lot more blue here. You see it start to blend in over here. And there's a reason for that. So with PKCS11, not only can you access your PKCS11 device driver, and so if you have a Crypto Express adapter, you know, you plugged it into the box and you configured it as an EP11 coprocessor, then you can access that. Additionally, PKCS11 has software crypto support, actually pretty extensive software crypto support. So if you don't happen to have, you know, your, your EP11 adapter, you can still do operations in software if you want. In addition to that, you still have access to CPACF, right? Those are the instructions that are available with each IBM Z box. And what's also cool is if you happen to have a Crypto Express configured as a CCA, those operations for PKCS11 can also be sent there. So PKCS11 has a wide range of uh, crypto engines that can be used under the covers for the various crypto operations. Now, I will say for some of you who do care about FIPS certification, um, the Federal Information Processing Standard, for those of you who do care, you may have different options depending on whether or not you need to have that FIPS compliance. So when you're in the FIPS mode for compliance, then maybe like the, one of the options may not be available to you, but that's really because we're just trying to make sure that you stay along um, a FIPS path. 
And for the most part, if you're using something like system SSL and FIPSMO, you're gonna be going down the PKCS11 path. Okay, other thing to mention here is that there are different key data sets associated with each architecture. You have the token um, data set. So you have the TKDS here, which contains secure keys and clear keys. You know, the secure keys, of course, are the ones wrapped by the Crypto Express, by master keys that reside on the Crypto Express. And then for CCA, you have the CKDS and the PKDS. Um, and those are available to the CCA architecture. And all of these different, um, you know, key stores can be managed by the EKMF workstation and your Crypto Express adapters can be managed by the trusted key entry workstation. Okay, so now everybody has like the same foundation. So let's start digging into some of the, some of the fun stuff. Okay, so let's work, like I said, we're gonna dig into the complicated stuff. It's not the easy stuff. And, and please feel free to ask questions. Like I said, this is new material that I created only within the last maybe few months or so. So there, so if you have questions or additional things, I can continue to work and add that into this deck and kind of make it stronger and, and better. So please ask questions as we go. So many of you have ICSF probably set up already in your environment. And so then the question is, do you have ICSF set up for your, your Sysplex? So let's kind of dig into what that, what that means. So you have your Sysplex that you can configure for multiple different LPARs. You know, they're all sharing memory, sharing data between them. Everything's running smoothly. Everything is great. And when the way that ICSF sees a Sysplex isn't necessarily the same way that you have configured your Sysplex to be set up. ICSF is actually has a means of what we call subplexing your Sysplex so that you, you can define and determine and configure which ICSF instances will share data with each other within your Sysplex. So let's say, for example, you have 20 LPARs in your Sysplex, in your Sysplex and they're all connected, they're sharing data, great. But you decide that you really only want like 10 of them in your ICSF flex. And so what you can do, you can just configure 10 of them for this <clears throat> ICSF flex and you can configure the other 10 for another ICSF flex. Where essentially those 10 systems that are configured, they will be sharing data and updates and keys and stuff like that between each other. And then the other ones, they can share their own set of keys <laughs> amongst each other. So even though technically all 20 LPARs are in the same Sysplex, from an ICSF perspective, you can configure it so that just 10 or just five or just two, you know, are actually sharing keys amongst themselves. Now, generally the value with having a Sysplex in it, of course, is synchronization. You want to make changes on one system and make sure that they're available on the other system so that you don't have to manually move keys from here, there, and so forth and so on. But there are some quirks and there are some like nuances that might be good for you to know as you go about managing these keys. So first thing, for you to define an ICSF Sysflex, two things are required. And those two things are, let me turn my laser pointer back on. Those two things are, you have to have the key data set name be the same. So, any, so when you're configuring ICSF, right, you have your ICSF installation options data set. So you have a CSF PRM XX member, um, probably sitting in Sys1 Perm Live somewhere. And you're going to have one of those for every ICSF instance, right? So each of those L parts, you're going to have a, you know, those parameter options. And what you're doing in those parameter options is you're saying, this is my CKDS name. So, okay, so let's say you, you have a CKDS name and that CKDS name is great. You're good to go on that one member. The next thing that you have to do is you have to put Sysplex, you have to turn on Sysplex sharing. So you can have the same CKDS name, but if you don't put in Sysplex CKDS, we're not going to do that sharing for you. So you have to explicitly turn it on. Now you might say, do we have to turn on always, like even if I only have like one member? Well, if you think you might add members later, just turn it on. It won't share anything if there's only one member. But if you do bring one on, you don't have to worry about having to bring down ICSF and bring it back up, you know, so you can turn on Sysplex sharing. So yes, you can definitely have a single system Sysplex. It's perfectly okay. And so what you do is in your prime line member, let's say for your first one, you have the CKDS name, and then you turn on Sysplex sharing. And then you're gonna have, of course, you know, all of your other, you know, um, all of your other details in your prime line member. So you have that for the, in this case, this will be your, this is A. And then you have another instance and you have, you know, ICSF B. And so for ICSF B, it's also gonna use the same CKDS name, 
and it's going to turn on sysplex sharing two. Great, so now we got two that are gonna essentially be in the same sysplex. Now let's look at ICSFC. With ICSFC, you see the CKDS name here matches the other, so that's a good thing. However, you notice that the check off, no, not check off, that the sysplex CKDS um, parameter is not there. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is you're gonna have this system, which has access to the same CKDS. So when it actually brings it up, you're gonna see the same CKDS. However, it's not gonna be doing any sharing. And we're gonna articulate that a little better. So let's just show that from our Sysplex perspective, looking at these three different LPARs or three different environments, we have ICSF set up, they're using the same CKDS name. All three are using the same CKDS name, but only these two at the top, only those are actually going to be considered part of the Sysplex. This one is not because it does not have Sysplex sharing turned on. And this is kind of, um, this is another way of just telling you exactly what I just did. ICSFC does not participate in the Sysplex, even though the CKDS has the same name. Um, and that's because Sysplex CKDS option has been omitted. Um, so therefore any changes that are made between these two systems will not be shared with this one, even though they're using the same CKDS. And I'll articulate a little bit more on the next slide when I show like a little bit of an animation of how this looks. Okay, so here we have our different ICSF instances. So we have A, we have B, we have C. And they are all sharing the same CKDS, right? Remember all three of them have the same CKDS name, but only two of them turned on Sysplex sharing. So what's gonna happen? So you're gonna have a step where in the very, very, very beginning, each one of these ICSF instances is gonna be started, right? So somebody's gonna go and they're gonna say, start ICSF or start CSF, whatever you named your, your proc. And when you start ICSF, what's it gonna do? It's going to go and read the disk copy. So it's gonna say, help, you're starting me up. Let me go read everything from the CKDS and let me put a copy of it in memory. And then ICSFB is gonna do the same thing. It's gonna get started up. It's gonna to go to the CKDS. It's gonna read everything into memory here. And then ICSFC is gonna do the same thing. It starts up, it's gonna read everything into memory and it's gonna keep everything you know, there. Now, what's gonna happen when you're gonna start making changes? So this will be a little interesting. So generally speaking, ICSF is gonna be working off of the copy in memory, right? It doesn't wanna to have to go to do the IO to the CKDS every time you wanna do an operation you're trying to read or update. It's gonna be operating off of its in-memory copy. So let's see kind of how that works. So step two here, you're generating a secure key and you're gonna add it to the CKDS. So you're gonna add the key to ICSF A, right? So go ahead, we take our key, we've generated it, and now it's in memory here. But what happens when, I, when it goes there? Because at some point, right, this key has to persist, so it has to go to the CKDS. So you generate the key, it's gonna go there, it's going to be saved here. But also you've turned on Sysplex communication, so that also means that the key not only goes here to be saved persistently, but it's also gonna move into memory of V. So you'll see that same key will be made available here, in the CKDS and also in ICSFB, right? So it's changed here, goes here and goes here. So now both of these in memory, they're operating off the same data. They can both see the same key. However, you'll notice here, ICSFC does not have Sysplex turned on, right? And so what does ICSFC happen to see? No change. It has no knowledge of the change that you just made because it's reading off of its internal memory copy. And its copy in memory does not contain the key because you didn't move it over. Now, if you wanted to pull in that key from the other system, you could do a CKDS refresh because the refresh essentially is telling ICSF that you want to go read everything out of the CKDS and pull it into memory. And so it's gonna, you know, you can manually do the read operation and well, manually do the refresh, which is essentially a read operation. So you can do that. But that is an extra step. That's not something that's happening, you know, in tune with your applications and your transactions and everything going. You have to actually go and explicitly do this. So meanwhile, these two systems are kind of humming back and forth between each other, making sure that the keys are synchronized and everything is, is going and good to go in memory. This one is kind of left out of the process. 
because it, it doesn't have the cisplex communications, it doesn't have it turned on. And so this one in, in, in basically is, is out of sync with these. Now, like I said, to get it in sync, just do a refresh and you can pull it in. And if you have a really good naming convention, it will, it, things will still work for you because you're gonna have, you know, different names and you don't have to worry about, you know, things clobbering other things, but it's just good to understand that if you're using the same CKDS name, but you don't have CISPLUS communications turned on, you're not necessarily seeing the most up-to-date data because there could be other systems that are updating, the, you know, updating the CKDS making changes and you, your one system will be completely oblivious of those changes. Now, if that's what you intend to do, then go ahead and do that. But if that's not what you intend, then you definitely wanna turn on CISPLUS sharing so that you can ensure that the updates that you're making between your systems are shared across all of the different ICSF instances. Now, hopefully that makes sense. I know it's one of the more complicated topics. And so I'll, I'll pose the question to the chat to see if that makes sense. If you have questions, is anybody using Sysplex sharing today? That would be good to know as well. Now give a second to see if there's any, any posts in the chat. Yeah, Lenny, that is true. Yeah, if you change the key on ICSFC, um, and then update the CKDS. This will eventually, this will pick up the updates, but yeah, there, there's a chance for, yeah, things being completely out of sync. So you either have to have a really solid naming convention, like some people they'll name their keys um, and part of the key label would be the, the LPAR or the system it's running on to kind of like distinguish. So that way you make updates, it's only updating that key for that LPAR, even though it's in the same CKDS. But just in general, it's not, it's, it's more wise to just use Sysplex sharing because then you don't have to worry about coordinating the updates or having to do that, that separation. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Cause ICFC can come in here and they can make changes as well. And the changes that ICSFC are making to the CKDS won't be seen by necessarily by, by A or B, right? because they're operating off what's in memory. So they would have to refresh in order to see the changes that have been made by ICSFC. So absolutely right. Okay. So, so that's one of the, the hard topics. And now let me get you to the, the what's new in crypto and then one of the other tough topics. I'll save that for the end if there's more time. Okay, so. Let's take you through this. Okay, so one of the, the features that we added, this was many years back, this was ATR 77 Baker 1, was the ability to, um, to have metadata in your key data sets, right? So in your key data sets traditionally, right, these are your, your CKDS, your PKDS, and your TKDS. You have, you know, key labels that you use to write to, to look up and to search. And then you have your key tokens that you're putting in there as well, you know, containing the key material so you can reference it by the key label. And then what's been added, what was added is metadata, things like crypto periods and key archival and uh, key reference dates. So all of these, this metadata section was added so that you can put additional information about that key into the record itself and keep it alongside that record. And you manage those through different callable services. Um, it was a KDS um, or no KD, MR and, and KDMW. <laughs> so key data set metadata write and key data set metadata read. So you also have the ability then to do like the KDS RL, so CSF K, KDS RL. And basically the idea is that you could also list, you know, what's in the actual, or I want to say, let me look at the, I'm looking at two different things. With KDSL is another service that you can use and you can actually list what's actually in your key data set and you can actually see the metadata and so forth and so on. Now, what's new, I'm not gonna talk about KDS RL, which is different. That's, I'll talk about that on one of the feature slides and you'll see kind of what that is. But the idea is as long as you have the proper key data set format, um, you can use this ability to do key archival. And we highly strongly recommend using key archival as an alternative to key deletion. Because as you know, with key deletion, if you're doing data set encryption, pervasive encryption, or even application encryption, if you delete that key, then essentially you can say you've deleted your data, right? Because you can't get to the data, encrypted data, if you don't have the key. So in many cases, you don't want to delete the key. You just want to archive the key, put it to the side, you know, and if somebody happens to need it later, then you can always recall it and bring it back to use. So that's kind of why we're saying archive keys don't necessarily delete them. 
So previously, what you could do is even if you archive a key, you could allow people to still use the key, right? So you archive the key. Essentially, you're trying to take it out of, you know, activation period. You're trying to, it's still active, but you don't want people really using it. So you're archiving it. And um, what you're going to do is you can turn on, um, you turn on one of the profiles or define one of the profiles to say, yes, I would like to allow you to still use the key. So that means that if someone comes, tries to come in and use the archive key, you'll let them do the encryption or the decryption operation and everything will hum along smoothly, just as it did before. Um, you will get notifications. So you'll probably get an operator console message. You'll get SMF records saying, hey, somebody used an archive key. And you'll have the opportunity to recall the key if, if you need to. So if you see an application is starting to use this key, you thought it was kind of a, a dead key, then you can recall it, bring it back into use, and that's perfectly fine. Now, in some cases, you might say, yeah, I'm really transitioning this key out, and I don't want anybody to use it or encrypting something new but I would like them to be able to decrypt the existing stuff. So if something had already been encrypted with it, allow the decrypt operation, but don't allow them to start encrypting new stuff with it because they don't want people using it anymore, right? Maybe they're transitioning it to be retired. And so there's an option available in ZOS 2.5 where now you can actually set a new profile and you can say that you want the key used for decrypt only. So that pretty much disallows them for doing you know, any kind of encryption or encrypting of new data with the archived key, but it allows them to use it. If there's some data that's already encrypted, you can decrypt it. So that's one of the new features that is now available in ZOS 2.5. Another new feature that's available is around um, master key change. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the idea of key rotation, right? the idea that you're gonna run and rotate your keys and some period. And we don't tend to define or tell you or prescribe like what that period is. If you decide you want to rotate your master key every year, every other year, every five years, it's up to you, your organization, your policies, the different regulations that you have to comply with. Um, it's up to you how, how far between you do your key rotations. But from an auditing perspective, it's often useful to be able to tell your auditors when you lasted a rotation. So whether your even if your policy was, hey, I'm gonna do this every month. Okay, nobody ever does that every month, but you could say you do it every month, but then you need to be able to prove that whatever your policy is that you're actually following it. And you often prove that using your SMF records. And so there's a new SMF record available that will show you when your master key has been changed. So SMF type 82, step type 49, as you see here, will show you the date that it was changed. It will show you the master key verification pattern, um, which is, as you know, it's just kind of a hash of a master key. So it's not your master key, it's just that the hash of that master key. And you can break down and you can see that, that master key verification pattern. Um, you can see it for the, of course, you know, whether it's RSA, whether it's elliptic curve or AES or DES, you can see that as well. Um, and just enough information for you to be able to, to say definitively, hey, this is when I did my master key change, or this is when the master key was set. And so that's very useful when you're auditing, like I said, and you're trying to prove that you are following your policy around crypto periods and key rotation. So there's also a, a sysplex view. So this is an, another view. So you can kind of see on the, on the left here. And for this, you can see the CKDS, you can see which systems are being shared. Now, remember what I just told you about the systems being shared, right? When you have a given CKDS or PKDS or TKDS, and you turn on Sysflex sharing in that options data set, that is how ICSF knows where to share your data. So in this case here, you have SysA and SysB, they're both sharing the same CKDS and they're doing the synchronization between them. That's how ICSF sees them. And so here you can see the dates, you can see which systems were impacted, um, you can see which master keys were impacted by the, the rotation as well. Um, if you want to see, so this is the, the KDS view. You can also see the MKVPs view, which is the master key verification view, and you can see the details there as well. So you can see the CKDS and you can see the date that they were changed and you can also see part of the MKVP as well. So these are just useful things if like, you know, before you have the, you know, you have the SMF record, so you have the SMF type 82, subtype 49. But in addition to that, if you wanna just display it on the screen, this is another option. Just issue the display command and you can view when the key was rotated. 
So just more feel for ease of use. Okay. So another thing we've been asked recently, and you'll see in some of these slides, like, kind of like hidden on the side there, is an associated RFE. So you guys will go out and you submit these requests for enhancements for different features and capabilities to be added to ICSF and, and other, you know, uh, ZOS components. And so this is just kind of tying in these features with the different requests that we've gotten from clients. And one of the things I talked about with the key archival was the idea that with the key record format, KDSR or KDSRL, you now have this metadata section where you can put in the crypto period information and key archival and all of these other flags and things that we can check. Well, in addition to the metadata that IBM defines, there's also metadata section that you can define. I think it's 500 bytes of custom metadata that you can put in there. It could be whatever you want it to be. Like in some cases for data set encryption, we talk about maybe um, putting in like the owner's email, like who owns this key or which application is associated with this key. Those types of things, you, you have 500 bytes, you can put whatever in there that you want to. And generally speaking, when you're putting data into the metadata section, you're gonna call those two different services. The CSF um, is a KDMR <laughs> and then the CSF KDM. W to write. So W will write R to read. And then you have the KDSL, which is a little list. So between those three different callable services, you can manage your metadata. However, in some cases, you want to be able to read or look at your metadata without having to write code to do so, right? So you don't want to have to call, you know, KDMR all the time to read the metadata. You want something that you can kind of look at in a utility panel. And though that is available now, and so in ZOS 2.5, you can go out to your CKDS keys panel, that's option 5.5. And you can see here where you can display variable length metadata blocks by tags. You can display the IBM variable length metadata blocks. You can display um, installation variable length metadata blocks. So basically the idea is that you have the ability to look at that different metadata you know, through the panel and not have to code a callable service in order to view it. So let's take a look. So here you can look by tag. So when you're creating your metadata, you're going to have a tag and then you're going to have values, tag length value, TLB. So you're going to have all of that information. And if you already know the tag and you just want to see a specific piece of information, you can do that where you just specify the tag and then it will populate with the, the value and you can see, you know, whatever data is associated. Well, here's not really anything readable, but there's data there. So, and it doesn't have to be readable, to be honest. It can be whatever data you want, whether it's something that's you readable text or where there is some binary data that you think needs to go in there. <clears throat> so the so another view of this is um, what are the IBM specific tags, the IBM specific metadata. So before I talked a little bit about last reference dates is something you can put in there. Another one is the key fingerprint, um, when the key was last used. So these are existing tags, so tag eight, tag five, tag two. Um, these are IBM defined metadata sections and you can look at those too. So all of this you used to have to code that callable service to do the read. And now you can actually do that all through a panel which makes it much, much easier. Um, another one in this case, this is custom defined metadata. So you see 8888888 is an Apple. Um, and you can see <laughs> your installation metadata over and over and over again. So the idea being that you can put in here your, your installation metadata, whatever that, that might be. And like I said, it could be an email, it could be a name, it could be an application's name, uh, it could be a person's name. So you have different options in terms of what you wanna put in there um, and how much data you have. <clears throat> okay, so getting beyond metadata. So let's look back at those key data sets in my KDSR, KDSRL format, which is not to be confused as I did earlier with the KDSL column service, which is the key data set list. So many of you might be familiar with the KDSR format. It was a format that was introduced, actually I think it was back in HR 77 ABLE 1. So that was, that was definitely one, well, I think it was like the ZOS 2.1 timeframe. But so it was in, introduced a while back. Um, and the idea with the KDS 
our format was that we wanted to give you the room for the extra metadata that we just showed you. And so now we have, we're entering a new era, I will say, the quantum era. And with that, our keys are getting larger. So it doesn't necessarily like the metadata is getting bigger though it could too, but the keys themselves need to be larger, right? Because now they're using lattice-based cryptography. We're looking at quantum safe algorithms. And so the, cut, the, the key sizes that we had assumed previously with our little buffer for metadata, um, we just don't have enough space in the records to accommodate the larger size keys. And so there's a new format now. And that format is KDSRL. So if you have ZOS 2.5, we strongly recommend moving to the new format. You'll still get all the features and stuff that you have with KDSR, but now you'll have the ability to support the larger keys, like whether you're using the dilithium keys um, or not, you know, the idea is that we have the, the support for the larger keys. And you'll notice here that the, the l -Reckel is much larger here. You're going to 32,756, whereas previously we were looking at 2048. So this gives us plenty of room for the larger keys. And the, the key data sets that you would have to change for this are going to be the CKDS and the PKDS. Now notice here that there is no KDSRL for the TKDS. And the reason is because the KDSR was already huge. It was already 32,756. So there was no need to add KDSRL for the TKDS. So you're still okay with your TKDS being the same size in KDSR format. It's just as you can see here, the l the, the record lengths for the CKDS and PKDS just were not large enough. And so now these are, are both expanded. And again, just to, to call out that um, definitely make sure you use the most recent format um, just because it does give you that, you know, additional same function as you had before, but also gives you the ability to support the larger keys, which you can't do with the earlier formats. And of course, as per usual, there's a conversion utility in the panels that you can use to convert between the different formats. Okay. So there's some additional function as well that is available um, if you're doing you know, encryption at the application level. So if you're looking to use password-based key der derivation function, PBKDF, there's now PBKDF2 support, which has which is basically a function that is resistant to like brute force and dictionary attacks. And, and that's you know, something that you definitely want to, to prevent. Um, you also have the RSA PSS support, which has been around for a while, but now has been extended to the CCA coprocessor. Um, it, well, it's been extended where you can actually use the coprocessor or the accelerator um, for RSA PSS. Um, additionally, if, you're, if you use um, elliptic curve and you're using that private key name section um, in the key itself, then you can actually enable ICSF to check that key name against you know, the CSF keys profiles. So you can do that as well. So those are some of the new capabilities that are also available. Big red X there. ICSF is changing how it's delivering crypto hardware support. So many of you may be familiar with ICSF where generally you would go and you would download ICSF you know, as a web deliverable. You would go out to the crypto support downloads page and download it. And the way that ICSF was delivered is we always had a release that went into the base of ZOS. And then there were always like some, what we call orphan releases that would come out in between. And the reason being because, you know, ZOS, you know, release, you know, they come out, you know, in their cadence, like two years or so when the, the ZOS releases come out. But there may be changes to hardware, there may be changes to the Crypto Express. And we wanna make sure that ICS, well, we, ICSF wants to make sure that you can exploit all of the necessary function, um, even if the hardware is changing, you know, between the ZOS releases. And so we would put out web deliverables so that we can provide that exploitation. Now the approach is changing, where essentially we're gonna make sure that we align our ICSF FMIDs with COS, but don't panic saying, oh my God, this is, you know, I'm only gonna get updates every two years and what if there's new hardware? And what are these things coming? Um, don't panic, it's not that. Mm -hmm. um, what you would be able to do is there would just be new SPEs. And you guys are most really familiar with the SPE process, I'm sure for, for ZOS. And so what you're gonna do is when there's a new feature that you, know, you wanna be able to exploit, whether it's in hardware, you know, Z hardware or on the Crypto Express, or we just decide ICSF wants to add more features. Um, those will be added as small programming enhancements essentially as SPEs. 
So if you have an old FMID, you know, if it's still, it's still like, you know, in its service agreement time frame, continue to use that. That is perfectly okay. Um, but for the future, you want to get, you know, new stuff. I recommend getting the new ZOS release, of course, and begin getting the SVEs. Now, don't panic if you're like, well, what happens if I need to get the new updates and I'm not on ZOS 2.5 yet? Are you going to leave me dead in the water? No. So we just we recommend that you go to ACR 77 dog one. So go to this release of ICSF and any new hardware support will be rolled down to dog one. So you can still take advantage of any of the hardware stuff on dog one. So, so that will be okay there. But if you want a lot of the new and cool stuff, still recommend going to the COS release, you know, two five or later and getting the SPEs. <clears throat> okay. So um, I also wanna call a few different um, APARs that are relevant as well that came recently. So these may not be necessarily like, you know, There'll be some in the base too, but then some of these a, these actually uh, a parts will, will roll back. So for OA five five eight 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 zero ZOS two four um, digital signature support for the Edwards curves and also for your lattice based quantum safe algorithm crystal dilithium keys. So if you're interested in quantum safe support, that will be made available. It will bubble up through ZOS two four if you have the appropriate L par. L -par. Um, TR31 key block support for HMAC keys um, will be made available. You also have um, CBN18 support if you are, you know, looking at EMB smart cards and those services. And another cool function is that you have CPACF protected key support for, for some of the elliptic curve keys. And you probably remember with protected keys, the idea is that you want to protect the keys that are in memory in the operating system um, and you don't necessarily want to have to make or take the path length, the extra calls that are necessary to get to the crypto express effort. So these are for things that you need to be super fast, but you also want them to be, you know, more protected than a clear key. So that's when you would use these protected keys. Um, another more cool features and things that are, are depending on your hardware, depending on your ZOS release, different A parts that are available. Um, what's nice is for those of you who are interested in format preserving encryption, um, there is now support for FF1, FF2, and FF2.1. And the idea with the, of course, you know, with format preserving encryption is that you're trying to encrypt your data, but maybe you have data that's already defined in a schema in a database, or maybe you have an application that expects data to be in a certain format, and you want the data to be encrypted, but you don't want to have to impact everybody because now you're passing cipher text instead of passing in real uh, clear text. And so with format preserving encryption, you can pass in cipher text that essentially looks like the original clear text. Same character set, same length, same format. You're passing it in and it looks like a credit card, but it's actually encrypted data. So that's one of the cool features that was added. Um, or I won't say it's added recently because we've had format preserving encryption previously. It's just that those particular algorithms are, are new and those will be available on, on ZOS 2.4 and the different hardware. Okay, clear key HMAC. So ICSF has the, let's see, doo -doo -doo. yeah, so ICSF already has, I'm gonna say ICSF already has the HMAC support. It does <laughs> in the CCA coprocessor. Um, it also has it in PKCS 11. Um, what was added is support in CPAC apps. So if you have your IBM, if you have like the latest, you know, if you have the IBM Z hardware for it, then you can actually do HMAC algorithms using that hardware instead of going to a card or instead of doing the, in the uh, clear operation, you can, well, I'll say instead of clear, instead of going down the PKCS 11 path, you can actually go through um, um, using CPAC apps. So we basically in both the CCA side and the PKCS 11 side, we have the ability to do HMAC support. So it just depends on where you want that operation to occur. So if you remember like the first, one of the first charts I showed you and I was showing you how you have the different architectures and they can go down different um, crypto engine paths. Essentially you have another path um, in terms of HMAC where it doesn't have to be necessarily software for PKCS 11. It can now go to CPACF. And if you're on a CCA side, it doesn't have to go necessarily to the code processor. It can also go to CPACF. 
So we're just opening up other opportunities for places where you can do um, different crypto operations. Okay, and I think this is the, the last one for the new stuff, enhanced Cheetahs key wrapping. So there's always something new and cool. And so um, with this one, you have the uh, triple DES token wrapping. And the idea is that it's a much stronger wrapping method than previously. I think it was a wrap enhance too. So I guess we just keep it up, bumping our number up whenever we get to stronger wrapping methods. Um, you can set this as the default, if you would like that to be the default. But the idea is that you can have this stronger wrapping um, that is available for triple DES keys. So, and you have it available through different, um, through the APIs themselves, the callable services, through the utility to do the conversion and also through, through Kega. Okay, so one thing I want to, to make sure that I kind of just go over very quickly is just best practices in general. And this was something I um, put together mainly because uh, after progressive encryption, lots of different questions, thoughts and things that came out of the different discussions with clients. And for this particular you know, piece, I wanted to kind of call out just things that have come up in those discussions that we want to remember as best practices. And I'm sure many of you are already doing these things. So you're probably like, yeah, I know all this, but that's okay. It's always good to, to refresh. So first on the left, think about your TKE, whether or not you need a TKE workstation. Um, TKE workstation is definitely recommended. It's the best way to ensure that you're um, master keys are loaded securely. In fact, it's the only way to ensure your master keys are loaded securely. Um, EKMF Web is a new kid on the block. I, I want to say it's new, but it, I think it came out last year, so I think it's not as new, still new relatively. Um, EKMF Web, EKMF Workstation, both of them are really great tools for managing the keys in your key data sets. Um, be mindful of your key label naming conventions. Now, if you're one of those that has the same key data set used, and some are in a sysplex and some are not in a sysplex, your key label naming convention is super important. Um, definitely super important there. But even if you do have everything configured with your sysplex and ICSF instances, it's still good to have a good key label naming convention, um, something that's well-defined. Um, key archival is important. Like we said, you really don't want to delete your keys. You want to archive them for later use. Um, because if you delete, you can't get it back. If you archive it, you can always bring it back. Crypto usage tracking. I don't know how many people have turned on crypto usage tracking. I almost I want to ask the audience if anybody has it or not. But with crypto usage tracking, it will give you insights into who is using crypto in your environment. When are they using it? What are they using it? Which algorithms are they using? Um, it's similar to, to Zert that you have now with your network security side, right? Well, Zert will tell you, hey, is somebody doing, you know, outdated handshakes or outdated cypher suites? Are they using those things? Well, this will tell you from an ICSF perspective, who's doing DES 56? Who might be doing, you know, TDS 192? Is that still sufficient in your environment? What was the job? You know, well, who was the user ID? So it gives you enough information so you can like, so you can kind of dig into knowing crypto in your environment. Key lifecycle usage auditing. You want to know when your keys are being used. You have to prove to your auditors that you're following your process. So definitely enable that. Your separation of duties, of course, is important for your master keys. Not having a single person having access to your entire master key. You're going to divide that into parts, whether it's two or more people. And those people have to come together with their key parts in order to load the master key. Key data set backup is critical. Now, for those of you who have EKMF, you essentially have your key data set backup already taken care of, right? Because those keys are stored outside of the key data sets and you can pull them in, push them in whenever you need to. But for those who don't, make sure that you're using appropriate backup and restore capabilities. So you can make sure your keys are available when you need them. Um, I talked about CKDS sharing and synchronization already, right? Talked about the Sysplex communications. Um, of course, all of you know to restrict access to your SAP resources. You should have UAC of none and only permit those to the resources that they need. Um, crypto periods are great for establishing and enforcing the use of your keys. So crypto periods are a little different in archival. With archival, you can kind of put the key to the side, it's still in the key store. You can still use it, right? You can still use it. You can turn on that profile and say, allow the use of the key always or allow the use of the key for decrypt. With crypto period, once that period ends, 
eh, that key could not be used. You're gonna get a failure message. There is no, no softness on the crypto period. And if you want that kind of enforcement, like if you're doing key rotation and you want some of that a dead hard stock, then yeah, use crypto periods for that. And you can always extend it if you want. You know, you have your crypto period between time A and B. And if you need more time, then just extend B plus one or B plus 10, whatever it might be. Um, make sure that you have redundant Crypto Express HSMs. And what I mean by that is when you're doing like micro code loads or any kind of update, or maybe you're migrating from one system to the other, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, your workloads, you know, any workloads are still going, you want those to keep going. So if you need to take a card offline, take one off and let the other two keep going, you know, and that when roll those outages, honestly, I'm going to say roll outages, roll when you make those updates so that you don't have an outage, <laughs> right? So that's what you want to do when it comes to your Crypto Express adapters. Um, key rotation, of course, it's very important to come up with that policy and figure out how often that you need to do that. Now there's nine minutes left. I do have the other advanced topic or I can take questions. So I'm gonna leave this to, as an audience poll. Do you want me to continue forward with the next topic, which is about two or three slides or do you wanna go into q and I'm checking the chat to see what your responses are. Unless I put everybody to sleep, which is another problem. <laughs> no, we're still here. I think Isha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Carry on. Carry on. Yeah. New slides, okay. please, says Lenny. Yeah. <laughs> Okie dokie. We'll do. Okay. So this is another topic that, that tends to kind of get a little confusing that I just want to, to add some clarification to. And this is around cryptographic domains. So many of you are familiar with the Crypto Express adapter. And as I said, you want to have redundant adapters so that you can make sure that your workloads and everything are running smoothly, even if you have to take one offline. Now, with the adapters themselves, you can they essentially support the idea of virtualization, where you have one adapter, but let's say you have 85 different LPARs, then you can have 85 different domains on the adapter. And you say, well, what's the point of having all of these domains? Well, each domain can have its own unique um, secret or its own unique data associated with it. So if you have 85 LPARs and you want to have different master keys across all 85 of them, you can do that because each one of those master keys can be loaded and associated with a particular domain. So same card, same physical card, but different master keys. Are associated with the different domains. And it's just like when you see in your ICSF Karma member, you can define a domain or it can happen. You know, you don't have to define it. It's a, defining it is, is optional if you just happen to have multiple. But um, the idea is that one ICSF instance is associated with a given domain. And so then it can access the master keys associated only with its particular domain and no others. So you essentially have cryptographic separation. Um, of your master keys and of your keys in general, because if your master keys are separated there on the adapter and all of the keys in your key stores are encrypted by those master keys, now you have separation where you can pretty much assure that somebody with a key data set with its own keys and its own master keys, they try to use their keys in your environment, it's gonna fail, it's not gonna work. They're not wrapped with the same master key, it's gonna fail. So you have that assurance of separation with your crypto. And that's assurance by, at the hardware level because we're honoring that domain um, separation. Now, where it gets confusing is when you have, you have multiple LPARs, you can have multiple cards, all of this kind of comes together. And then you have this CKDS, which may be shared, and you're trying to figure out, well, how do all these things work? So I will attempt to explain that and we'll see whether I do a good job or not. So one of the things that you're gonna do when you're setting up your environment is you're gonna to need to assign cryptographic domains. Every ICSF instance has one, one, just one domain that it's going to run under. Just one, that's all. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how you did, what you did on the HMC, ICSF can only run in one domain. That is it. So when you are putting through your Crypto Express adapters together, you are saying, hey, I'm going to say I have three adapters, like in this example here. And for these three adapters, I'm going to assign them to these different, you know, these different LPARs, or three, three, these three different um, entities. Huh? 
And then you have to further subdivide to say the master key, the key material for this particular uh, domain is associated with one LPAR, just one. So let's look at this. So let's look at LPAR A here, ICSF A. So three different cards here. ICSF A is associated with domain zero, and that's it, just domain zero. So because ICSF A is associated with domain zero, and there are three Crypto Express adapters, domain zero in each of these adapters is going to have the same master key material. Just domain zero, that is it. So when you go and you do a master key load and you're loading across all of your cars in that domain, it's only going to assign them to the domains you have given it. And that is one domain across those three cards. That is it. Let's say you have another ICSF instance, this green one here, ICSFB. Well, he's assigned to domain one. So he gets domain one here, domain one here, domain one here. So green, it's all the same masterpiece. ICSF in here, which represents, you know, however many LPARs you can possibly have, has this domain in, in, and in. Notice there is no crisscross between these, none whatsoever. So you have to make sure that you have that mapping. Now, what gets really interesting is if you have a disaster recovery system and now you have these cards, you know, they may be new cards <laughs> and they may have data in the domain that you have assigned to a particular ICSF instance. And what does that mean? That means that ICSF is not gonna be very happy with you. That master key doesn't match what it's expecting to see there. Because it really is not just about having the cards there, but it's about also making sure the correct keys are in the appropriate domain for the ICSF instance that you are running on. So hopefully that, that makes sense there. Now, what would be really fun is just to add a little extra, it looks a little extra fun is, well, what happens with your key data sets now, hmm? right? Because you have at the bottom here, let me move my little box over. You have at the bottom here, so this is your, this is your box. You have your three adapters, you have your ICSF instances. But what happens if they're sharing the same CKDS? What does that require then? Because the CKDS has how many, well, let's see, for AES, let's, use, let's pick an acronym. So for AES, how many master keys? are associated with a CKDS. And you feel free to answer in the chat. If not, that's fine too. Like how many master keys or how many NKVPs are there for the for AES here in your CKDS? I'll give one second and then I'll go ahead and answer. Well, the answer is one. You only have one. There is one AES master key associated with the CKDS. So what does that mean? If you want to share this CKDS, across these different instances, they must all be loaded with the same master key. And what does that mean from a car perspective? That means, I mean, zero here, one here, in here, zero, one in here, zero, one in, in here, all must have the same master key in order to work with the CKDS, all of them. <laughs> and that's simply because you're sharing your CKDS and there can only be one master key associated with that particular CKDS. Now, of course you could decide to have multiple CKDSs and then you can do your sys flex, you know, and decide that maybe A, B and N are together. And then you can have C, D and E be like a separate CKDS. You can do all kinds of like combinations like that. But the idea is when you're sharing that CKDS amongst multiple LPARs, you can only have one of a given type of master key. And that has to be loaded across all of these domains. Now, where it gets interesting is if you don't have a TKE workstation and then you have to do all of these domains separately, which is not fun. And, and I won't even say you have to do all of the domains separately. It's more like you have you would have to do the ICSF instances separately. So for a given instance, like ICSF A, if you're trying to load a master key, you can select all three cards and it already knows which domain it's running in. So when you do your master key process, you do the random number generate, you do your checksum, and then you do your load it's gonna load it across all of these, you know, automatically because you've, you've set it up so that it knows which cards are associated with it. But then after you do A, then you have to do B and you have to do the same process. Go on to B. 
And then you're not gonna do the random generate because you at this point you need to use the same key. So you gotta copy that key material over and then you gotta save that key information there. And then you have to make sure that that key material is um, loaded in there. And then the same thing here, same key material has to be loaded there. So TKE definitely makes this a lot easier, but the idea is that the key, if you're sharing that, that CKDS, your master key must exist across every instance that's using that. And that means every domain, every Crypto Express, every ICSF instance. And I think that, that's it. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, if not, feel free to ask questions and let me know what you think. Um, but those are some of the more complicated topics. It's the synchronization and it's also, you know, how do those cryptographic domains work? Thanks, Isha. I love how you're hugging that Z14 there. <laughs> it, was, it was Valentine's Day, hug a mainframe day. <laughs> oh, <that's cool. laughs> so any, um, they're so cool looking. I just want one in my home to add to my collection of servers and things. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but any, any questions for Isha? Your line, you can unmute your line, by the way, if you want to have uh, enabled that feature, or you can post in chat. May I ask a quick question, Isha? What you talked about, like master key rotation. What's what was what's your kind of what's the best practice for frequency, or does it just depend on the organisations? That's exactly what I always tell people. I'm like, it oh, okay. depends. I can't. It's like I've, I've heard like some people do it like every year. Some people do it every couple of years. I've heard every five years. So it just it just it varies across the board. I have not heard like one comment like everybody does this thing for the master keys. Okay, no problem. <laughs> maybe someone in the audience might want to share how often they do it. Maybe not, but um, oh yeah, that'd be good yeah. to know. Yeah, we could take a poll. Like, what is the most? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have the poll feature enabled, but it'd be good to have that. But um, NIST suggests yearly. Oh, okay, thanks, Greg. Yeah, yeah thanks, I, Greg. I, you know, in the back of my mind, I thought, yeah, yearly is the kind of well, happy medium, I don't know if that's the right word to use, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, last final chance, folks. Any questions for Isha? Will we wrap up? No? Going once, going twice? <laughs> All right, so this is session 1B1 for the purpose of feedback. Um, so, as I mentioned at the beginning of uh, each session, this is the last security session of the day. So, if you have a backlog of feedback to do, please do get it in because your feedback, as I said, contributes to your CP points if you need them, feedback for the presenter, feedback for GSE, but it also goes towards, you know, who is going to win best speaker award and user speaker award if they fall into that category. So, it's really important you do that. Um, and I think the uh, best speaker and the user speaker will get announced at our wrap-up session, conference wrap-up session at 6.15 UK time today. So no pressure to get those in. Um, don't forget also, you know, about the charity. Um, if you do donate to our charities this year, you can um, enter into the raffle. So it's really important that if you do do that, get the little code that you get on your receipt from the raffle into the website so that you can um, go into the, uh, the raffle there and you might win a prize. I never win anything, but I'm hoping someone will. <laughs> but this is the last security session of the day, but it's by no means the end of the conference. Um, so there is a 30 minute break uh, now or 25 minute break. And at five o'clock, there are other sessions running in the other streams. There is another sort of security, I say sort of, there is a security related topic that is running in the storage management stream. And this is uh, new ways to protect your data at rest with ZOS data set encryption. And that's with Cecilia Lewis, my VM. So I think that's well worth uh, going to if you want to continue the security, uh, the security related lectures. But that's it for security. And I cannot believe uh, how quickly it's gone. It's just like it's all gone in a flash over two weeks. And there's one person I really want to call out uh, today who's been uh, kind of my uh, but well, my virtual assistant, hey Sue. So Sue's been, uh, you know, uh, keeping an eye on the door, letting people in, and, and uh, keeping me sane over the last two days and um, over the last two weeks, and all the good work that she does. So thank you very much, Sue, for uh, 
all your assistance. And thanks to all the presenters as well that have contributed this year to all the attendees for the security stream. I, th I think we've had a really, really good two weeks. And we will be back next year. So just a date for your calendar. So in addition to the conference, um, for those of you that you know don't frequent GSE that regularly, this is your first time. The work, some of the working groups on GSE UK do meetings throughout the year. So security next year, we will do a working group on March the 3rd. Um, and that at the moment looks as though it's just going to be online only. Um, so, you know, uh, over the last two years, we've done that via Zoom. Um, so we are on the hunt for presenters. I will do a call for papers and um, there'll be a kind of a, a save the date announcement will go out from the G GSC mailing list. So if you are interested in presenting for that, do drop me um, an email at jamie.ps at gse.org.uk. And then there will be another meeting as well later in the year around sort of the July timeframe, um, and, and as well as the, the conference as well, which is looking like we'll be back together in Whittlebury Hall next November. And there'll be more details about that. But yeah, once again, thank you so much. And uh, it's really sad, like I say, this is the last session of the security stream, but um, do tune in to the other sessions. And um, after those sessions are finished, one final point, like I said, the conference wrap up starts at 6.15 UK time. So do join that if you can. And um, that's a keynote from Mark Wilson, our um, GSE conference uh, manager and region manager as well. Anyway, thanks. And thanks once again, Zisha. Lovely to have you back. I'm sure you'll be back with GSE at some point to, uh, to present us with more great updates on the world of crypto. So um, thank you, everybody, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.